Hello, this is Tommy B. Lamb, pastor of The Church in Buffalo. Our church is proud to present to you the following Bible study series hosted by Pat Moreland. Pat is the founder of Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror is an organization dedicated to discipling men to become spiritual leaders in the home, the church, and the community. For more information, you can visit the website maninthemirror.org. It is our pleasure to present these teachings to our community. I know the blessings these teachings are to the men of our church. For me personally, I have been challenged and encouraged. We'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to our men's meetings. We meet the second and fourth Saturday of each month at 9 a.m. at the church. The church is located at 592 Thomaston Highway. Our prayer is that these teachings deepen and strengthen your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Sit back and enjoy this Bible lesson by Pat Morley of Man in the Mirror. Good morning, man. So last weekend I was in Edmonton, Canada. And you know how when you wake up in the middle of the night and you have to go to the bathroom, you're a little catatonic. I don't know why, but I decided when I got up in the middle of the night in Canada that maybe so that I wouldn't have trouble getting back to sleep, I, I wouldn't turn the light on. And so I went into the bathroom and, uh, and I was thinking to myself, man, they sure have quiet toilets in Canada. And then I went back to bed, and I got up the next morning, and uh, I had peed all over the floor. Uh, <laughs> so I thought we should probably start a new series here at the Bible study uh, this morning. Well, actually, over the last uh, few weeks, we've been uh, looking at, at this whole area of being faithful and discipleship, making disciples, rebuilding the broken down walls. We looked at the parable of, of the ten minas, and the big idea was, what is my agenda? What is God's agenda? And are we working on the same agenda? And then we looked at the life of Nehemiah, and that was during Fuel Week when those men from Fuel were here. And we, the big idea was a, that a servant is not asking, what do I want? But a servant is asking, what does the master need? And then the last time we were together, we did the battle for men's souls. And the big idea was that anything less than a plan to disciple every willing man is a catastrophic moral failure. And so I thought we'd do a short series, maybe six weeks, we'll see how long, and that we would call a city of disciples. So what would a city of disciples look like, and how can we make that happen? And probably uh, just as important, <clears throat> what would... God like to see happen in our city, and when he looks at our city, what does God see? What does God see when he looks at our city? What is his agenda for the city, and then how can we be a part of that? So uh, this first uh, thing we're going to do is give a shout-out. The first thing we're going to do is give a shout-out, and I'm going to walk over here and advance the slide. And the shout-out this week will go to two new groups. One is uh, led by uh, Peter Linebaugh, and it's the Encounter Community Church in Belding, Michigan, a men's group that's wanting to grow in their relationships with Christ, and they re wanting to reach out into the community to help others uh, know the grace of Christ. So uh, welcome to you men. Also, a second group led by Terrence Red, uh, the Concord Fellowship Baptist Church, Richmond, Virginia, a men's group that's been together for a dozen years. Uh, who are looking to move to a deeper level in Christ. And so these two groups are, are joining us at the Man in the Mirror Bible Study. So I wonder if you'd join me in giving them a shout-out and a warm welcome to Man in the Mirror. One, two, three, hoorah! Welcome, guys. We're glad to have you with us. And uh, by the way, if you're online and we haven't given you a shout-out or haven't given you one in a while, send me an email and we'll do that. All right. So today's message is entitled... <coughs> Thank you, Scott. A fresh movement among the men of our city. 
And turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if you're not already there. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So Jesus, when he leaves, he leaves the Great Commission. And really the book of Acts is what we do as laymen uh, with what Christ has given us. Here's what he gives us. Uh, we'll, uh, let me read from verse 4 on. Uh, on one occasion after the resurrection, while he was eating with his disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then this is what I want us to really focus on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so what is God's agenda? God's agenda is for us to be his witnesses. Scott, there you go. What is God's agenda? God's agenda is for us to, to take this power that he has given us and be his witnesses here, there, and everywhere. That's his agenda. So, <clears throat> we see also in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, if you would turn there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. That Paul, when Paul took this command to be the witness of Jesus seriously, then he gave an instruction to the people that he was witnessing to. And his instruction is found in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And he writes, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will be qualified also to teach others. And so, uh, so I say to you, Pat, so Paul is basically saying, uh, follow my example as I follow Christ and the things that I'm teaching you, you entrust those. Now you take the things that I've entrusted to you and you entrust them to reliable men. And so I'm saying that to you. Follow me as I follow Christ. If you, you see a place where I'm not following Christ, then don't follow me there. But follow me as I follow Christ. And the things that you have heard me say you take those things and then now you go out into our community and you entrust those to others, to reliable men who they themselves will be qualified to teach others. You want to start a fresh movement uh, for, for God among men in the city? That's how you do it. That's how you do it. You, you obey God's agenda. You obey God's agenda. Now, there's one more scripture just to sort of Give this a little bit more texture, and that would be at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. So turn, I guess, back a few pages to the left to Ephesians chapter 4. And let's start at verse 1. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, so he was in prison at the time, he said, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. You have been called to a great life by a great God for great things. And I urge you to live a life worthy of that calling. And then he goes on. He said, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the bond of unity in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is one body, one spirit. You were called to one hope. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Man, that's, you want purpose, buddy? That's it. And then he goes on. And he says, to each one of you, grace has been apportioned. You've been given gifts. And then down in verse 11, some of these gifts. It was given, <laughs> it was he who gave some of you to be apostles, some to be evangelists some to be prophets, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that everybody might be brought to maturity in Christ. And so why don't we have a city that's full of mature disciples in Christ? Because of disobedience. 
it's, it, he lays out the master plan. Go and be my witnesses and trust the things that you're told to reliable people. You've been given gifts. Now it is required that whoever's being given a trust must prove faithful. And to take these gifts and go do the work of an evangelist, go do the work of a prophet, go do the work of an apostle, go do the work of a pastor, go do the work of a teacher, equip people to do good works, to, do, to be mature spiritual disciples, attaining the full measure of Christ. And so when you look at, at any city and you see a city that is not filled with disciples, then you know that there, in that place there are people who are being disobedient to God. There are enough Christians in the United States, enough professing Christians in the United States to overwhelm every city in the United States. So, what is God's agenda? Well, God's agenda is this. It's to mobilize an army of bold, equipped disciple makers to take the cities, to take the cities. To be obedient. So what is God's agenda? God's agenda is be obedient to his word. God's agenda is this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. This is the big idea. Watch this. For there to be a city of disciples, there must first be a city of disciple makers. And that's the big idea for the day. A city of disciples must first be a city of disciples. Of disciple makers. How can you end up with a product when you don't have the manufacturing plant? A city of disciples must first be a city of disciple makers. Well, how can we make this agenda of God happen? Scott, it starts with me. It starts with me. Now you're thinking, perhaps, hopefully not, what can I do? What can I do? You're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, what can I do? The question is, what can our great God do through me? It's not you. It's not you what you're going to do. It's what God God is going to do when his Holy Spirit comes upon you and you then go be his witness. So it's not about what you and I are going to do. It's about what God is going to do. (laughs) If you're asking, what can I do? You're asking the wrong question. A much better question is, what can God do through me? And I think the reason that, I uh, could be wrong, but I think the reason that a lot of men are asking, what can I do, is because they don't have a big enough God to think that God can do something bigger than they can, well, what they can do. They think that they are more powerful than God. And so it, if it's going to start with me, it's going to start with me having a, a, a more powerful, unfiltered God. I need a bigger God. Hello, I'm Creation. And I am the Theory of Evolution. Why, why are you so happy? Oh, are you kidding? Because I have hope. Hope? Mm-hmm. You know, and the assurance that I have a purpose. A purpose? Mm-hmm. You can have one too, you know. I don't want one. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everybody wants to have a purpose. That's not true. Some people want to hold to the unproven fact that we're nothing more than a bunch of protoplasmic goo that evolved over billions of years and will end up as cosmic garbage, therefore serving no one or no purpose at all. No hope or purpose? Right. So sad. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. These three cannot exist without this. Under God, under God, indivisible, under God. indivisible with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Some things were never meant to be independent.
Since 2001, Man in the Mirror has been training church leaders to reach and disciple men. Thousands of leaders across the country have attended a No Man Left Behind conference, spending two and a half days in intense training. Most of these leaders took time off work, traveled to another city, and spent a night in a hotel away from their families. Yet virtually all of them would tell you it was a great investment. Yet now this training is available to you and your leadership team in a brand new way, whenever and wherever you can get your team together, on your terms, announcing the No Man Left Behind self-paced training. And not only that, I'm also here because I'm pretty sure that all of you have men in your churches, not only like my dad, who are going to, to pull the plug on church, but you have guys like my grandfather who are going to pull the plug on the families. The Foundations course gives you the basics leaders need to make meaningful plans to reach and disciple men. And so the idea is to engage someone who needs Christ, introduce him into a relationship with Christ, and get him started on his discipleship journey. To take a cultural Christian, help him understand what a real commitment to Christ looks like and how to live that out. Get him moving forward, a biblical Christian, to become more oriented towards leadership, towards serving others, reaching others. It's a way of looking at the things that the church does and helping to maximize the impact, the kingdom impact, of every interaction our church has with every man. From the UPS driver, to the guy singing on the praise band, to the guy working in the nursery, working in the parking lot, handing out bulletins, and collecting offering as an usher. Wherever men are in the church, all of those activities are an opportunity for us to help a man become discipled. The Methods and Tactics course gives you practical strategies to organize your efforts. Why are your guys more committed to college football than they are the gospel of Jesus Christ? But there's another part of it that comes back to us as leaders. Because we have not done a good enough job, we have not been good stewards of the opportunity of casting a vision for our men to call them to something great. A lot of times we get guys excited about something and then they go away because we haven't captured the momentum. And so whenever we get guys interested and involved, we always need to be ready to show them the right next step. Each course includes eight video sessions featuring the No Man Left Behind faculty, including Dr. Patrick Morley. Teaching, a panel discussion, and stories and illustrations all help your leaders grasp the concepts. Then you'll discuss questions designed to help you get on the same page. Finally, practical exercises help you apply the concepts to your church. When you complete the two courses, you'll have a solid plan to disciple your men and create a sustainable ministry. This conference has been very exciting. Uh, all that I've gotten, I can't wait to get back to my church and give back to those men what I've gotten. The No Man Left Behind conference showed me a new way of discipleship for all men, both in and outside the church. The all-inclusive concept was very revolutionizing to me. I never heard that. and really blessed my life and uh, I just want to thank you for all that you've done for us. God is going to be glorified because of how he works through you to transform the hearts and minds of men and that in turn is going to help transform the world. They think that they are more powerful than God and so if it's going to start with me, it's going to start with me having a, a, a more powerful, unfiltered God. I need a bigger God. So I'm in a small group with a man named Michaela. He's the vice president for global church-led movements for Campus Crusade for Christ. Big position. His uh, dream was to be a scientist. He... Uh, his dream was actually to be a great scientist. He came to the United States, and then five weeks later, God called him back to Ethiopia, where he is from. But Kayla uh, grew up in a small village in Ethiopia. And he was related by blood, his family was related by blood to the witch doctor who lived at the top of the hill. The witch doctor who was possessed by demons and worked for the demons and was the demons um, evangelist. 
in the area. And so, Bekela's father was also uh, taken by the demons. And the demons gave him very specific instructions. You're to smoke, you're to drink, and to your, you are to beat each of your three wives. And if you disobey me, I will kill your children. And so, Bekela had uh, a big family, and... Uh, when his father would disobey the demons, the demons would kill one of his children. Bekela lost 12 brothers and sisters who were killed by demons. I'm talking about an unfiltered, powerful God here, all right? An unfiltered, more powerful way of seeing the world. And so, when the family would eat each night... Bekela's father would take the first plate of food and he would go outside and place it uh, under a tree. And the family was not allowed to eat until the demons ate the food. And when the food disappeared, then uh, Bekela's father could go in and the rest of the family was allowed to eat. In the morning, at each of his three homes, they had an altar. And on the altar was a, a large bowl filled with alcohol. And he had specific instructions that his wives were to keep these three bowls of alcohol full at all times. And the first thing that he was to do in the morning was to drink the alcohol. And so, one day, when Bekela was four years of age, the demons told Bekela's father to begin training him in the ways of, uh, that he was following. And so he began smoking and drinking at the age of four. When Bekela was five years of age, two angels came to uh, appear to his father. And they told him about God. He didn't know about God. And the angels took him to heaven to see how wonderful it was. And then they took him to hell to see how wicked it was in the body or in the mind, in the vision, who, they, don't, they don't know. And then they asked him, where do you want to be? And he said, I want to be in heaven. I, don't, I, I, don't, I never wanted to leave heaven once I was there. Not long after that, <coughs> uh, the, the two angels uh, finished their conversation. They said, in two days, some men will come and tell you how you can be in heaven. Two days later, uh, two men arrived, and, and they had... They were itinerants. They couldn't read. They couldn't speak. Uh, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't read. They were uh, illiterate. And uh, they had only been Christians themselves for one week. But they told Michaela's father about Jesus and how he could accept Jesus and go to heaven. Michaela was listening in, and Michaela said, does, if, if my father accepts Jesus, does that mean he'll stop beating my mother? And the two men said, yes. And Michaela said, then I want to receive Jesus too. And so on that day, both the father and his five-year-old son received Jesus Christ, and everything began to change radically. One day, not long after that, Michaela's father was walking next to a river, and there was a Bible sitting on a rock. He had never seen a Bible before, and he heard a voice that said, that is my word. Michaela's father was illiterate. He could not read or write. He went over, and he sat down on the rock, and he opened the book, and he could read the words. And... Uh, for the rest of his life, when he opened the Bible, he could actually read the words that were in there. When he would open any other book, the words were dark to him. He could not read any other books, but he could read the Bible whenever he opened it. And so <clears throat> he went back to his village, and since he was a, a powerful, had been a powerful evil man, uh, when he called the village together, they all came together, and all four villagers came, and then he told them about Jesus Christ, and all 400 villagers received Jesus on that day, and the entire village was converted. This was happening at several other places in this tribe of one million people in Ethiopia at that time. He was not the first man to have had the angels appear to him in this tribe of one million people in Ethiopia 37 years ago. And now today, 97% of those one million people follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, let me ask you about your God. Are you following an unfiltered God or are you following a filtered 
God? Are you following an American sort of sanitized, dumbed-down version of God? Or are you following the powerful God of creation, the maker of all things? Or are you listening to those little voices about, oh, well, maybe, maybe all these different things that are going on in our culture, all these different conversations, all these, all these stupid, foolish, ridiculous conversations... If you want it to start with you, then ask the question, what does, what, what can God do here in this city? What can God do? I have my marching orders, and frankly, you have yours too. And the question is really only whether or not you're going to obey them. So, the big idea today is this. A city of disciples must first be a city of disciple makers. Now, some of you are not ready to be a disciple maker. You're, you're the makee, not the makeor, okay? So, you just take this in today. You just take this in. But men, if you have been discipled, If you know what it means to have Christ on the throne, if you really have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then, then if, you ha- if, if you have not been marching, then today is the day to, to, to begin. Now, most of you are. I, just, I mean, this is, this is a, a Bible study of guys who get it and are getting it done. But if for some reason you have not been getting it done, or if you kind of you kind of got lulled into a little complacency, all right? If you're, if you're meeting people and you look in their eyes and you can see nothing and you don't say something, then you need to re-enlist. Because a city of disciples must first be a city of disciple makers. That's the way it is. That's the way God designed it. So, to become a true believer that God is as powerful as God says he is, and to become a true believer that obedience is what he requires of me. Next and last. What does the master need? What is God's agenda? It's that we be as witnesses, that we'd entrust these things to others who would be also qualified to teach others, and that we would take these gifts that we've been given, this grace that's been apportioned to us, and we would be worthy to the calling that we have received, and that we would bring people in our community to maturity. And and we call it a fresh movement among the men of our city because God's not calling you to, to win the women and the children. Uh, He's calling you to win the men and then equipping them to win their families and to lead their families. Win the men, win the city. Hey, win the men, win the family. Who did I say said that first? Satan said it first. Who said it best? God said it best. Win win the man, you win the family. Win the family, you win the church. Win the church, you win the city. Win the man. You win the marriage. Win the marriage, you win the family. Win the family, you win the church. Win the church, and you do win the city. Look, there is a problem that many churches are not making disciples. I get that. But I I tell you this, the greater problem is that many churches think they are. All right? Hello, I am Creation. And I am the Theory of... Evolution. That's right. Watch out for the tail. (laughs) The tail. I was just trying to break the ice. Right. I figured you did that. Yeah, and I figured you'd... No, okay, that's that's funny too. Thank you. Yes. Look, I realize it's difficult for some people to fully grasp me. Well, that's just because you don't make any sense. Well, it does take a certain... uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Something... uh, Imagination? No, no, no. It takes a lot of... uh, Deception? No, no. What's the word? A lot... Faith. No, don't ever use that word. Sorry. Evidence! That's the word. It takes a lot of evidence to fully grasp who I am. That's evidence, right. yeah. 
Like the fossil record. Exactly. So you guys have finally found all the transitional forms? No, 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 no. Oh. We found a few, right? I mean, after 150 years of searching? No, uh, no, not a one. Oh. So there really is no evidence? Right. So it does take faith. What did we say about that word? Sorry. Oh, well, yeah, there you are again. It's me, the finger pointer. Forgive me if I if I skip over all the chit-chat, but I'm, I'm a little short on time, and I, I got lots to say about all your shortcomings, so just, just just bear with me, if you will. I got a question. I got one little question, okay? And some of you are going to hear it, and you're, you're going to take your little tithe envelopes, and you're going to make your first donation to get this guy's face off my screen foundation. But some of you are going to have the fortitude and the courtesy to stick through this short, albeit mind-slapping soliloquy. So are you ready? Are you ready? Here's the question. One question. What are you going to do with Jesus? That's it. We got all kinds of debates popping up all over the red and blue states in this great country of ours. Intelligent design, evolution, what are you going to do with Jack Bauer, blah, 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 ad nauseum, ad nauseum, blah, 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 all that stuff. But you know what? That's just the art of David Blaine-like misdirection, my friends. That's all it is. Left to knock you off the main question. Knock you off the main question. That's all it's doing. Because the main question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Come on, people. Come on, you can't deny the fact that he's the central character to the biggest selling, furthest reaching, life changingest, most inspirational, controversial, and scandalous book of all times, right? He's the guy that says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Son of God and God at the same time. He's the creator, the sustainer, the word, the bread of life, and the Lamb of God, all those together. He is the redeemer and bearer of our sins. That's what he says. Yeah, all things are held together by him, and the matter, science, all of it popped into existence by his very word. That's what it says. He's our comforter, he's our mediator, he's our he's our friend and our judge. But t- titles that are endless, endless titles about the guy. And you know what? I don't have time to talk about all of them. You got a Bible, take a peek if you got the guts. The point is, the point is, people, these aren't just nicknames his mommy gave him when she was sewing together a tunic for temple time, okay? These are words and titles that if you actually know what they're talking about, would make you shudder in your boots, okay? It would make you question everything. It would make you rebel and disgust if you don't believe it or jump out of that anti al Gore gas-guzzling Hummer and shout for joy. It makes you do something. You got to do something with a guy like this, don't you think? I mean, come on. After all, think about it. What he said, what he taught, the fact that he transformed the very planet that we're on demands that we make a choice. And if you make a choice to do nothing, that's the something you choose, okay? So there ain't no, there ain't no, I want to take my ball and go home. I don't want to play in the game because everybody's in this game, baby. Everybody. There ain't no bench warmers. No, 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 no. And you just consider yourself lucky because you get to play in the game with the guy who is the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies. He's the muse to countless poets. He is the the theme to a million love songs and the hero to a thousand stories. And that's just the facts, Jack. Okay, he's the most talked about, preached about, debated about, lied about, and fought about man in history. So if you just think he's a good little sensei right now, you know what? You failed the test, Daniel, son. Time to go wax on a little more. If you think he's just a good man, if you think he's just a good man after all this, you haven't been listening. And most importantly, if you think he doesn't change lives, You never met him. So I asked the question again, what are you going to do with Jesus? You can't be neutral. He says he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, goes to heaven, except through him, period. All right? Bold words, outrageous claims. As a matter of fact, if I think of all these claims, if I think of everything he said, and you ask me in my less than humble opinion, it's ludicrous. What he said is absolutely ludicrous. Unless, of course, it's true. And if it's true, what are you going to do with Jesus? If you don't believe or you're sure enough to bet your eternity on it, if you still got questions, why aren't you asking them? And if you're a believer, if you're a believer, why aren't we doing something about it? Why aren't we doing what he says and why aren't we sharing his story, huh? And by we, I mean you, because I'm just, I'm just too darn busy pointing fingers. By the time the Civil War was over, 600,000 men lay dead. That would equate to 6 million men today. These were real men with real families. Today, our nation is again fighting an internal war, one that makes the devastation that took place in the 1860s pale by comparison. This battle is raging out of control in neighborhoods across America, your neighborhood. Think for a moment about the casualties taking place on your street, where you work, even your church. Men leave, women weep. A little 12-year-old girl prays, God, why is my daddy so angry? This is a real battle. These also are real men with real families. When you look at the church, do you see men leading powerful, transformed lives? Though there are inspiring exceptions, most men lead tepid, 
lukewarm, somewhat defeated lives. Why is that? In Matthew 22, 29, Jesus told some confused religious leaders, the problem is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. The core problem is that most men have never been discipled to be godly men, husbands, and fathers. They don't understand what it means to follow Christ, not really. Who's to blame? Well, that's not the important question. What matters is this, evangelism without discipleship is cruel. The statistics are numbing. For every 10 men in the church, nine will have at least one child who will drop out of church. Eight will not find their work satisfying. Six are only paying the monthly minimums on their credit card balances. Five admit to having a major problem with pornography. Four will get divorced, affecting one million children every year, and only one will have a biblical worldview. And all 10 are struggling to balance family and work issues. The collateral damage is staggering. For example, 25 million children, one third of our kids, will go to bed tonight in a home without their biological father. The American family is in deep crisis, and it's not because of women, and it's not because of children. The American family is in crisis because a lot of men are in a lot of trouble. The conclusion is inescapable. Men have become one of our largest neglected people groups. The staff and directors of Man in the Mirror want to lock arms with you to help these men lead powerful lives transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a battle we can win. We cannot, we must not, and by God's grace, we will not fail. Hello, I'm Creation. And I am the Theory of Evolution. You know, why is that? Why is what? That you're a theory. Well, because I sort of kind of haven't been proven at all yet. Well, what do you mean, yet? Well, there's a lot of scientists still trying to prove anything about me. Oh, how's that coming? Yeah, not so good. Not so good? Nope. I'm sorry to hear that. No, it's okay. What about you? What, proof? Well, yeah, why aren't, why aren't you a theory? Well, because every design has a designer. Oh, but what if that design is random? <laughs> That's not possible. It has to be. Why? Hey, look, it's the missing link. Where? <laughs> You're just joking. I'm sorry. Now that's random. I want to give you five preliminary steps what does the, for what the master needs. Five preliminary steps. The first one is to be a leader, and not just any kind of leader, but a leader of a certain type. So I have a PhD in leadership and organizational change. That means that I've read the literature on leadership, most of it filled with glittering generalities. There was a study that was done a number of years ago, decades ago, that found no common, no common set of characteristics among leaders except uh, that um, something about had to do with, with longevity of marriage. But other than that, no particular personality, age, uh, temperament, uh, educational background. Just, However, there is a powerful research-based conclusion that Jim Collins came to and is recorded in the book, Good to Great, <clears throat> about what they, ha they call a level five leader, a level five leader. And I'm just going to give you an overview of this. In 1971, a seemingly ordinary man named Darwin E. Smith became the CEO of Kimberly Clark, which at that time was a stodgy old page paper company and its stock had fallen way, way behind the general market. Smith was the company's mild-mannered in-house lawyer, and he wasn't so sure the board had made the right choice, and the board wasn't so sure that they had made the right choice either. But what a 20 years it was. In that period, uh, Smith de created a, uh, a stunning transformation of Kimberly Clark 
into the leading paper-based consumer products company in the world. And under stewardship, they uh, had four times as much uh, return on their stock, and they beat out rivals Scott, Paper, Procter & Gamble. They outperformed Coca-Cola, Hewlett Packard, 3M, and GE. It was an impressive performance. I'm reading from the book. One of the best examples in the 20th century of a good company, taking a good company and making it great. Yet few people, even ardent students of management and corporate history, know anything about Darwin Smith. He probably would have liked it that way. A man with no airs of self-importance, he's more comfortable around plumbers and electricians around his backhoe on his Wisconsin farm. But if you think that Darwin Smith was somehow meek or soft, you would be terribly mistaken. He had a fierce, even stoic resolve toward life. Smith brought that same ferocious resolve to rebuilding Kimberly Clark, especially when he made the most dramatic decision in the company's history, sell the mills. They sold all their mills. They made this decision and because they wanted to be a world-class competitor against companies like P&G. So like the general who burned the boats, they, they, they sold all these mills and announced this decision. Okay, the business media called the move stupid, and Wall Street analysts downgraded the stock. Smith never wavered. 25 years later, Kimberly Clark owned Scott Paper outright and beat Procter & Gamble in six of eight categories. Smith, a classic example of what we came to call a level five leader, an individual. Now, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. An individual who blends an extreme personal humility with an intense professional will. Extreme personal humility with an intense professional will. Humble and determined. We found leaders, watch this, we found leaders of this type. So this refutes the previous findings in leadership literature. We found leaders of this type at the helm of every good to great company during that transition period. Like Smith, they were all self-effacing individuals who displayed the fierce resolve to do whatever was needed to be done to make the company great or the city great, or the church great. Le and then there's a little shaded box here. Level five leaders channel their ego needs away from their cells and into the larger goal of building a great company or a great city, if you prefer. It's not that level five leaders have no ego or self-interest. Indeed, they are increasingly ambitious. But their ambition is first and foremost to the institution, not themselves. So what does the master need? He needs humble leaders with determination that they are going to succeed no matter what because they have a powerful, unfiltered God working for them. Rather, they have a powerful, unfiltered God they are working for. That's number one. Number two, prayer. Luke 6, 12 tells us that Jesus prayed all night before making a major decision. And what was that major decision? It was the selection of the 12 disciples. So as a preliminary step for what the master needs, he needs you humble and determined, and he needs you to pray. He needs you to pray for the city. He needs us to pray for our cities. Number three, turn with me to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Verse... 7, Romans chapter 13, verse 7. The next thing that God needs from us right now is to, for us to realize that, that we are not the first ones to have these thoughts, that, that we are standing on the shoulders of great men and women of God who have faithfully been gospel workers in this city and every other city where this message is going to be heard for decades, that we're just the next iteration of people who have a vision for the city. And so, so 
it is, it is, I see this all the time where a new ministry and a, a new leader who's not humble will come along and has this great idea that he's going to change the city. And, and he acts as though he's the first person who's ever had this thought. And so he alienates everybody else along the way, really turns them off. And as though he's the only, yeah, like he's the, like he's the, he's the one that we've been waiting for. Now, so Romans 13, 7 says, give honor to whom honor is due. Give respect to whom his respect is due. And so that's why we do things like give the Jim Cyber Distinguished Service Award. That's why at the, at the Leadership Prayer Breakfast, we give out a Lifetime Achievement Award to a leader who's, who's been there, uh, been in the trenches, and, and made it happen year after year. That's why last year we did a Pastor Appreciation 5K to give honor to whom honor is due, to give respect to whom respect is due. And so, so instead of barging in, honor those who deserve honor. The seniors among us who have been, been at this for a while, give respect, give honor. Uh, look, you, you and I would not be here if, if somebody else had not been here before us. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't give ourselves spiritual birth, you know, come out of the birth canal and, you know, pull ourselves up by the own bootstrap, you know, cut the umbilical cord by ourselves. We didn't do that. Somebody did that for us. And we need to give honor to whom honor is due. So number one is be a level five leader. Uh, number two is be, be, start with prayer. These are the preliminary steps. Number three is, is before, you start, before you start reaching out, make sure you're giving honor to whom honor is due. And then number four, it starts at home. It starts at home. Uh, a man reminded me recently from, uh, from uh, Huntsville. Uh, it was at our field conference and. And so he was all revved up to go and do men's discipleship and take his city and everything. And, and uh, so I said, well, tell me about yourself. And, and he was having problems at home. I said, I don't want you doing any ministry to men until you have a ministry to your wife. You, have, you, you, you minister to your wife and you get that right. And then you can do ministry to men. But I don't want you doing ministry to men until you get your ministry to your wife right. Which he followed to his credit. So your number one discipleship group is your family. Your, your chief responsibility, that's the way God set it up. He put us in families. And so your chief responsibility is to disciple your family. You should, your, your number one prayer group, fellowship group, small group, Bible study group, share group, home group is your family. So, so what does the master need for a fresh moon among the men of our city? He needs for for you to disciple your own family first. And then just a fifth, fifth preliminary step is to get yourself trained. So if you don't know, if you don't know how to go and be a disciple maker, the big idea is, is that, uh, the, the big idea is that if, if we're going to have a city full of disciples, it has to first be a city full of disciple makers. So get yourself trained to be a disciple maker. And there are easy ways that you can, you, for, there are easy ways you can get involved. Uh, for, for example, this, this new book uh, is just out. It's, it's Christianity for You. And uh, I, I wrote this book to go straight into the Books by the Box program. Straight into the books. By, so you can get these books for about 80 cents a piece. All right? Well, you, at 80 cents a piece, you can, you can throw them out like Frisbees to people in your neighborhood. So we've got them for sale back there. Buy some. Uh, you can buy a case of 12 or a case of 48. Buy some books. And this weekend, go around to your neighbors and, uh, and invite them to church on Sunday and, and then give them a copy of this book. That's the kind of thing that disciple makers do. You want to start a fresh movement among the men of our city? Uh, well, if you want to do that, then you've got to be a disciple maker. And you have to do the things that disciple makers do, and that means that you need to get trained. That means that you need to get trained. My, 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 my. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Ten years from now, is it going to be the same way it was ten years ago? No. 
It's not. So many of you men are making this happen. I praise God for you. And for those of you who have, uh, have a, had a stirring to do something great for God, this is something that you can do. You can be a disciple maker. This is the mission. This is the mission. This is the great commission. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you are unambiguous, even though the enemy tries to put veil after veil after veil in front of this truth so that it looks blurry to us. We thank you that we have places like this, Bible studies, where we can come and see your truth unvarnished and hear about God, the power of God, in an unfiltered way. And Lord, I pray that for those of us who have been, who have been the frog in the kettle who have been, been being lulled to sleep. Lord, I pray that we would jump out of that hot pot and that we would get back into your business, the business of making disciples, and that we would see here a city of disciples and everywhere cities of disciples. We make this prayer for your glory, for your praise, because of your power, in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Hello, this is Tommy B. Lamb, pastor of the Church in Butler. Thank you for watching this Man in the Mirror Bible study series. My prayer is that you've been challenged to become the strong Christian that God desires each of us to be. If you've tuned in and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would like to pray with you and for you. I can be reached at the church office at 478-862-5966. If you don't have a home church, we'd like to invite you to visit us at any of our weekly services. Please come and join us. We'd love to see you. For more Man in the Mirror Bible teachings, tune in each week to your local Flint Cable, Channel 14. Thank you, and may God bless you as you grow in here.